Hello, this video is going to be about uh, my first uh, experiments with the Motorola 68000 CPU. Uh, ever since last year that I made a very simple Z80 computer, uh, which actually didn't do much more than uh, uh, blink a couple of LEDs by running a program. Um, I, was th I kept thinking about uh, making a proper 8-bit computer. Uh, however, lately I changed my mind because I remembered that I always wanted to play around with a 68000 processor, um, which is a much more advanced 16-bit uh, processor. So since I never had a computer uh, based on the Motorola 68000 processor, uh, such as uh, an Amiga or an Atari ST, uh, I thought uh, the best next thing is to actually make my own computer and play around with that. So I decided to look around on eBay and uh, I bought a few 68010 processors. Uh, the 68010 is a slightly more advanced model than the 68000, although the differences don't really play any, any big part in my plans for a simple 16-bit computer. So since I uh, never even seen one of these chips before, uh, I thought uh, what's uh, the best way to, to familiarize myself with it before actually uh, committing to a, to a design of uh, even a prototype computer. And uh, the idea that I came up with is to try and make a similar experiment to the one that I had previously with the Z80 processor of uh, being able to single step through the execution of a simple program and see how the, the processor interfaces with the rest of the circuit and uh, how it uh, operates. Another reason that I thought the 68000 would make a, a good processor for experimentation is also that from the specification it looked that it's uh, quite simple to interface with. Uh, it doesn't need multiple power rails, it just takes a single 5 volt supply uh, and it doesn't need any uh, strange multi-phase clocks like uh, some Intel processors. So let's get started. The way I used to handle single stepping the Z80 processor uh, was very simple indeed. It was just a matter of connecting a switch to the clock input of the processor and then by just um, opening and closing that switch, I was in control of when the processor would uh, execute every single cycle. It turns out single stepping the 68000 is not that simple. The reason is that the 68000, unlike the Z80, employs uh, dynamic registers. Uh, that means it cannot keep the contents of the registers without a steady stream of uh, clock pulses. If we take a look at the datasheet, we can see that there is a maximum clock interval limit of 250 nanoseconds. Uh, this means that the processor cannot possibly work correctly uh, if there isn't a continuous stream of clock pulses of at least 4 MHz. So how then can we single step the 68000? It turns out there is a way. However, it's not as simple as just holding the clock like we did with the Z8. The key lies to the ability of the 68000 to insert wait states. So what happens when the 68000 wants to read from memory is that it places uh, the address of the part of memory it wants to read to the, to the address bus and then asserts the read and uh, address strobe pins. Uh, we can see those pins over here. This is the address strobe and this is the read pin. Uh, whenever this pin is uh, high, uh, the, the, the processor wants to read from memory and whenever the pin is low, uh, it wants to write to memory. So what happens next is that the processor just waits there. Uh, if the memory subsystem doesn't respond immediately, the processor keeps inserting wait states. So what the memory subsystem has to do, and this applies to I.O. devices as well because they are accessed in exactly the same way as uh, regular memory on the 68000, um, is to latch the address bits, decode it and figure out which part of memory the, the access has to go to, place the data corresponding to that address on the data bus and pull the DTAC uh, line low. Uh, this signals the processor that the memory has already place the data on the data bus and that it can now proceed to pr proceed with the rest of the of the bus cycle so the processor reads the data
and uh, stops asserting the address uh, strobe signal. When the address strobe is, is released, then the memory subsystem knows to return uh, DT acknowledge to its original uh, high value. This way, it doesn't matter how long the memory uh, takes to decode the address lines and uh, figure out what kind of data it has to put in the data bus, uh, because the processor will just wait and wait and wait until uh, it sees that the DT acknowledge uh, has been pulled low. A similar mechanism is employed to write to memory and we can take advantage of this mechanism to control how often the CPU would be allowed to complete each bus cycle. By controlling the DT acknowledge line ourselves, we can thus stop essentially the processor from proceeding further and even though the clock is still running, the processor essentially is just frozen until we signal that uh, the data on the data bus is, uh, is valid. The idea is to keep the DTAC line high for the most part and uh, only take it low whenever we want the processor to take the next step. Uh, an important consideration is that the processor actually samples uh, this uh, DT acknowledge line on every falling edge of the clock. So we must make sure that uh, this low pulse is uh, at least uh, as far as the next uh, falling edge of the clock. Uh, however, there is a, a problem here. We cannot just attach a switch to this uh, DT acknowledge line and uh, just press it by hand because we will not be able to keep it low for only a few nanoseconds. If this line is held low for uh, more than a couple of clock pulses uh, and uh, the processor then uh, happens to sample this uh, DTAC line again at, at this point to see if it can continue with the next instruction, uh, it will think that we just gave it permission to go on. So uh, since uh, this clock is 4 MHz, it will actually skip uh, hundreds of instructions by the time we are able to take our finger off the button. So what we must do actually is construct the circuit that uh, makes sure that uh, the DTAC line is held low for uh, as long as necessary, uh, but not more than that. So ideally what we have to begin with is a switch uh, with a low pass filter to debounce it. Connected to a Smith trigger gate. The output of which we'll call step. However, this is not sufficient. What we really need is a one-shot circuit that allows us to keep the button pressed for as long as we like, but outputs a pulse for exactly one clock interval. Uh, in order to achieve that, we can chain a couple of uh, D flip-flops together. And if we take the positive uh, output of the first one and the negative output of the second one, the inverted output, and we feed it into a NAND gate, uh, the output is exactly what we need to drive the DTAC signal. Let's see how this works. So this is the step input, which might be something like this. And we can see that it goes on for um, more than a couple of clock pulses. Now if we take a look at the output of the first D flip-flop, so that's Q0, uh, we'll see that uh, initially it's going to be 0, and uh, these are positively positive trigger flip-flops, so at the next clock pulse, uh, after step goes high, Q0 will go high as well. Q1 at this point is low, and it's going to remain low until the next uh, a rising edge of the clock after Q0 goes high. Which also means that Q1 uh, is high until that same point. Now you will see that the shaded area uh, corresponds to when uh, Q1 prime and Q0 are high. And whenever this happens, 
the output of the NAND gate, which is uh, what you use to drive the, drive the DTAC signal, is going to be low, and only then. So we can see that regardless of how long the initial step pulse was, uh, DTAC is only low for uh, as much as one clock pulse, and it is going to be sampled uh, by the processor during this falling edge of the clock, and correctly signal the, the processor to take the next step. When step goes low, uh, during the next uh, rising edge of the clock, Q0 will go low, which uh, will make Q1 go low uh, after yet another clock pulse. Um, however, you will notice that uh, during all this time, uh, Q1 is low, so uh, it's not going to trigger another transition of the DTAC line until we push the button again. What I've written here is a simple 68000 assembly program that will help us demonstrate how the processor executes uh, instructions while single stepping through it. First of all, it loads the value uh, AAAA in hex uh, to the register D0. Um, the reason I chose this value is uh, that the, the bit pattern is quite distinctive. It's uh, 10, 10, 10, and so forth. After this value is uh, loaded into the register D0, we are entering a loop. The first thing we do at the top of the loop is output uh, whatever happens to be in the register D0 to a hypothetical I.O. device uh, located at the address 80 hex. I.O. devices in uh, the Motorola 68000 architecture uh, are simply accessed by regular reads and writes. There is no such thing as a separate address space with separate uh, I.O. instructions like the x86 or the z8. Then the next step in the loop is to invert the value of d0, so that should produce something like 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, etc. And at that point we're just branching to the top of the loop. The idea is obviously that while going through this loop, um, different bit patterns are uh, written to the hypothetical I.O. device that we can see and verify that uh, we understand how the processor uh, works. Obviously, before we are able to feed these instructions to the actual processor, we have to convert them from the symbolic assembly code uh, we have written to the corresponding opcodes, the numbers that uh, the processor understands uh, and is able to execute. In order to do that, we could have used an existing 68000 assembler, such as the GNU assembler, for instance. But it turns out that uh, the GNU assembler produces uh, longer instructions than uh, necessary. And since uh, my plan is to fit these instructions manually, I want to assemble them as uh, memory efficient as possible to keep the number of switches I have to flip to an absolute minimum. So since this program is uh, quite small, it is uh, very easy to assemble it by hand. In order to learn how to convert our symbolic instructions into opcodes, we have to go into the Motorola 68000 Programmer's Reference Manual. This document specifies for every instruction exactly how it is uh, supposed to be encoded in such a way that the processor can understand it. Uh, for instance, I have here the move instruction, which is, the, which is uh, the first instruction of our program. We can see that the highest order bits of the instruction, bit 15 and bit 14, should be zero, so let's start there. And the next two bits are going to specify the size of the operation. In, in our case, we're trying to move words which means 16-bit uh, values, in which case we have to use the second option over here, which is 1-1. Uh, so the first byte of the instruction should be 3. After the size field, um, we have to specify the destination. The destination is uh, made up of two parts, two 3-bit values for register and mode, uh, which is exactly the same as, uh, as with the source after that. So the next, uh, to find out what values we, sh we should place uh, in this uh, part of the instruction, we have to go to the next page. And uh, we can see that if we want the destination as we do to be D0, the first register, uh, then we can use the encoding 00 for mode, uh, I mean three zeros for mode, and the register number uh, for the register field. So that's a 0, 0, 0 which is the register field, and again, three zeros for mode. And that's our destination. Um, after that, 
we need to specify the source of the operation. And the source is exactly the same, just flipped over. So first we have to specify the mode bits and then the, reg the register bits. In our case, um, the source of our instruction should be this immediate value over here. So we cannot use this table, which uh, has to do with registers. And we have to go over here, you can see that for immediate values we can use this row. So we have to specify a mode of 1, 1, 1. and uh, a register field of 100. Zero, zero. And that is our source. So obviously the, the instruction should then be followed by the immediate value and the complete encoding of the instruction uh, is going to be 3 0, 3, C. So let's start with that. 3, 0, 3, C, followed by A, 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 A. And that's the first uh, line, line of our code. If we then, then do the same uh, process for the second instruction, it is also a move instruction, so we'll start with uh, the two zeros at the front. 0, 0. It's also a word instruction, right? So 0, 0, 1, 1. So again, the first byte of the instruction should be 3. And uh, now we have destination, which is the address of the hypothetical I.O. device that we want to, to store to. So if we use again the destination table, we can see that um, obviously, again, we cannot use this uh, first table, which uh, has to do with the registers. And we have to specify the address as a word. So the first, uh, the first row of this table tells us exactly what we have to use. Um, if I remember correctly, the first field is the register bit. So that should be z three zeros, followed by the mode bit, which should be three ones. Let me double check that. Indeed. And uh, the destination, in this case, should be D0. So we can uh, go to the first uh, row of the first table here and just put uh, all zeros in these fields. 0, 0, 0, and 0, 0, 0, because we have to deal with the register. Uh, so this is the register and mode bits uh, of uh, the destination. And this is the mode and the register bits of the source. Obviously, again, this should be followed by the value 0080. So the full instruction encoding is uh, 1, C, and 0. So again, if I remove the PDF from the top right corner, we can uh, mark down the next instruction, which should be, uh, as I said, 31C0, followed by 0080. And this is that part of our program. So let's do the same for the next instruction in our program, which is the NOT instruction. This is the page of the reference manual uh, for the NOT instruction, and we can see that it starts with a binary value of 01000110. So let's start there, 01000110, uh, followed by the size, which in this case, uh, a word operation, which we're, we're actually interested in, is the value 0, 01. So 0, 01 for the size, followed by the, well, it's called effective address. What it means is uh, the operand of the not instruction, um, which is again a mode field, three bit mode field, and a three bit register field. If we go to the next page and take a look at the table, um, since we're trying to invert D0, we can use the, this first row of this table. So uh, mode should be just three zeros and the register again three zeros because it's D0. So uh, this is the mode. And again, this is the register field. And so the encoding of the complete instruction is four, six, four again, and zero, four, six, four, zero. And that's 
this node instruction over here. Let's do this operation once more for the branch instruction. There are multi multiple different encodings for this instruction. Depending on where we want to jump, we can either use the 8-bit displacement, 16-bit displacement, or 32-bit displacement. If we can use the 8-bit the displacement, which in our case we can, since uh, this is just a short branch, um, we can see that the instruction can be encoded in a single word. And it specifies that the displacement field should be a two's complement in integer specifying the number of bytes between the branch instruction and the next instruction to be executed. So in our case, we have to skip uh, the branch instruction, the not instruction, and the move instruction. Total minus eight bytes. Right? So that's a minus eight uh, displacement. Let's see how this is encoded. It starts with uh, binary value 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So the first eight bits of this instruction are 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, and again 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, that's right, followed by the 8-bit displacement. So what is uh, minus 8 represented as? Uh, the 2's complement of uh, any number can be calculated by inverting its bits and then adding 1 to it. So in our case, uh, the bit representation of 8 is just 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, because it's an 8-bit value. And uh, if we invert that, it becomes 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. And if we add 1 to it, it becomes um, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. This is exactly why we, what we should uh, insert here at the 8-bit uh, the displacement field. So that's a 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. So the final instruction of our data stream is going to be 6, 0, F, 8. And now, since we have uh, encoded the whole program into machine language, we can use those values to conduct our experiment. So I had this idea that instead of using an EEPROM to store my program and uh, let the processor have a go at it, it would be fun to actually use these switches over here to provide uh, the opcodes myself to play the part of a really, really slow uh, memory. And um, the, idea, the idea obviously is that uh, I want to be able to set any of the 16-bit data lines of the processor. Um, these LEDs uh, show the low, uh, the, the, the low order byte and the high order byte of each 16-bit uh, word. And uh, I'm able to set them using these eight switches um, by setting whatever binary value I want here and then uh, pressing set high or set low. So obviously this uh, switchbox is not just a bunch of switches connected to the to the data lines directly. Uh, rather I'm using a pair of 8-bit uh, latches. Um, each of these uh, latches are actu is actually a series of 8 uh, uh, D flip-flops. Um, however, they have the crucial ability to disconnect their output from the rest of the circuit. This is important because when the processor is trying to drive the data bus, uh, for instance, when it's trying to write to memory, it's uh, very important that we're able to tri-state ourselves uh, from the, to tri-state the, the, the latches from the rest of the circuit whenever the processor is actually trying to write. And this is accomplished by using the read-write line of the processor. Whenever this uh, write line is, uh, this read-write line is uh, low, the processor is trying to write. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm inverting that signal and feeding it in, into the output enable pins of uh, the two uh, latches. And uh, I also have an indicator light over here to tell me whenever the output is enabled. Um, a very nice side effect of all this is that uh, whenever the processor is actually driving the bus and uh, our latches are disconnected, these uh, 16 LEDs uh, are still showing the content of the data bus. So we can actually see whatever the processor is trying to write. So what do we have here? Obviously this uh, big chip over here is the uh, Motorola 68010 uh, processor. Uh, this is actually a slightly more advanced model of the 
standard 68000 processor. Next to the processor we have the clock generator, which is this bit over here. Um, it uses a 4 MHz crystal to generate a 4 MHz square wave, which uh, in turn drives the, the clock input of the processor. Uh, we have a bunch of LEDs that are displaying the lowest 8 bits of the address bus. Obviously, uh, this processor has a 24 bits address bus and it would be quite a lot of LEDs if I wanted to show all of them. Uh, but by keeping our program small and uh, contained to the lower part of the of the of the other space, uh, it should be fine. We we can just see what's going on with these LEDs over here. Actually, the first LED is not connected to anything because uh, uh, there is no address zero line to the Motorola 68000 processor. Generally, it reads and writes 16-bit uh, words from memory, so address line zero is always um, zero. Um, it does have the capability to read bytes from odd addresses, but this is handled not by putting an, an odd address into the, the address bus, but rather by using the upper, um, uh, what was that, the upper data strobe and the lower data strobe uh, outputs over here. We're not going to use those at all at the moment. Um, this uh, LED over here will light up whenever the processor is trying to read and it's going to stay uh, off uh, whenever the processor is trying to write to memory. So this is a good indication of what's going on. And uh, these three LEDs over here can mostly be ignore ignored actually. It, it, it's just the function code um, provided by the processor which can tell us uh, whether the processor is trying to uh, access uh, data, the data address space or uh, code address space in case we want to keep that separate. These two buttons down here uh, are actually the reset switch. We have to keep the reset, uh, the reset line low for a few milliseconds uh, during power up so that the processor can um, initialize correctly. Other than that we're not going to use this button at all. This however is the step uh, button that I talked about previously um, and it's using this uh, simple one-shot circuit over here to insert wait states and uh, make the processor wait for us to complete every read or write uh, bus cycle. So let's see how all this works in practice. Um, to start the processor I have to hold the reset button down so that it initializes correctly and it's ready to go. The first thing the processor is trying to do is read from address 0. Why does it try to read from address 0? Because um, it's trying to read in the values of the reset vector. The reset vector is supposed to contain in the first 8 addresses of memory um, the initial values for the stack pointer and the program counter. Uh, we don't really care that much for the stack pointer However, uh, the program counter has to coincide with uh, wherever our, our program is supposed to be stored. Uh, this is a little uh, cheat sheet I made with uh, all the addresses in memory that we care about and the values that correspond to those addresses. And this is a disassembly of the program that we saw previously. So the important bit is that our program starts at address 40 hex and that's what we have to uh, use as the initial program counter value. However, let's uh, start by setting the stack pointer. Um, high order uh, word of the stack pointer is just zero and then I'm gonna use something uh, within the, two, the first 256 bytes of memory so that we can see what's going on but other than that we don't really care that much. Uh, so let's do it for the low part of the stack pointer. Uh, then it's trying to read from address um, 4, as we can see, uh, the high order uh, word of the program counter. And then it's going to try to read from address 6 the low order of the program counter. So uh, in address 4 we want all zeros. And uh, in address 6 uh, we want the, the value 408. So that's um, this is the low part of the address and zero is the high part. Right, and uh, as you can see, the very next thing it does 
after reading the initial program counter values is to fetch uh, the first instruction and where is going to find the first instruction to wherever we set uh, the initial program counter so it's it actually tries to read from address 40 uh, in address 40 we have the the start of the move uh, instruction over here and that should be 303c so the high order uh, the higher order word should be uh, 30 and the low order word should be 3c that's the correct value uh, next uh, it's trying to read from address 42 hex and uh, we have to insert uh, whatever we want the immediate value uh, we intend, intend to load to the register d0 that's a a a a both high and low uh, next uh, it's doing a read from address 44 hex um, and that's uh, the start of the second move instruction which is the top of our loop actually so that should be 31CO so 31 is that right? yes that's right and uh, CO CO that looks correct um, afterwards uh, we're trying to read from address 46 hex uh, where we should put the address of the um, hypothetical uh, output device uh, where we intend to, to write the value of uh, d0 that's o, uh, o, o eight, uh, zero. so that's the low part uh, wait, is that right? no, that's not right uh, that's the low part yep that's correct. You will notice that uh, the, the next thing that happens is not the execution of the move instruction. It's actually trying to read the next instruction in line, which is, uh, comes from address uh, 48 hex. That's because the Motorola processor has a two-stage pipeline. So uh, during the, this clock cycle, it's going to read the next instruction and at the same time execute the previous instruction. So we're going to use another clock cycle before uh, this value is written to the bus. Let's see how that goes. So the next instruction, which is the inversion of D0, is um, 4640. So that's uh, 46. Uh, is that right? Yes, that's right. And 40. I think that's correct. And now you will notice uh, that first of all, this LED has turned off. So we're not actually trying to read from memory this time, but actually writing to memory. Uh, the address at which we're trying to write is exactly the address of the I.O. device that we have specified previously. So that's 80 hex. And the data lines contain uh, whatever was in D0, which was the value, the immediate value that we have loaded previously, AAAA. So if that gets executed, then we continue with the next instruction line and uh, we are asked for instruction at, at, at the, for the opcode at address 4a 4a will have the branch instruction over here um, the opcode for which is 6of8 so let's insert that 6of8 i think that is correct now you will notice another very interesting thing uh, this branch instruction should uh, should go minus eight places uh, minus eight bytes um, from where we are at the moment however instead of asking us for the address 44 h which is the top of the loop as we would expect it's actually asking us for the address for uh, c eights which doesn't really cont contain any part of our program that is exactly for the same reason that we said previously uh, since we, this is a two-stage pipeline processor it doesn't actually know yet that it will have to jump 
to the top of the loop. So it is, it is trying to fetch the next instruction. There is no kind of uh, branch, branch prediction or any other complicated circuitry, circuitry like that uh, in this processor. So it will actually uh, fetch the next useless instruction from here and then discard it and jump to 44H. Let's see that happening. We don't care whatever, uh, whatever value we're going to set to the data bus. And you can see that we now have the value for, uh, uh, yes, 44H to the address bus. So now it has executed the branch instruction and we're back to the top of the loop. Let's continue a little bit, a little further. I'll uh, insert this instruction to the data bus. So we are at, uh, yes, 44H. So that's a 31CO. So 31, 31, yes and C O. The next instruction in line is, uh, no actually this is the same instruction, just the, the value, um, the address which is 0080 00 and 80, that is correct. Uh, we still get to, to insert that uh, note into the instruction stream. So that's uh, four, uh, six, bear with me for a moment. Uh, is that, yeah, that's four, six, uh, four, oh. And when we do that, four, six, four, oh, you can see that the next write, uh, which is the execution of uh, this move instruction over here, is going to be for the inverted um, it's, it's going to be the inverse of what we initially had into D0 because previously, uh, in, in, during the previous loop, uh, this not uh, instruction was executed, which inverted all the bits, and now we can see the result of this uh, inversion. As an afterthought, let me also show you something else that is quite interesting. We can see how the processor um, implements exceptions. Um, so if we, uh, let's continue a little bit further with this program and uh, what I'm going to do is that instead of uh, using the correct minus 8 value for this uh, branch instruction, uh, what happens if I use an odd value here, so if we jump uh, not to 44H but say to 45 or 43H, um, then that should raise the address error exception within the processor. So where we are at the moment, um, yes, this value gets written to the output device. Uh, then we have to enter the 4A, which is this branch instruction, and let me do that. So that's 6 O. that should still be the same. But instead of F8, I'm going to use F... Uh, nine. Let's see what happens now. Obviously the next instruction is going to be fetched, but after that, aha, you can see uh, that we're actually now writing to some weird address. Um, this is not a very weird address actually, it's, it's the address at the top of our stack. If you remember, we set our, our, uh, our stack to uh, something like C O, and uh, this is just one place below that. What happens is that uh, while entering an exception handling uh, procedure, the CPU will um, push a bunch of values onto the stack to save the, the, the context of execution at that point, so that after handling the execution, if we have um, a full operating system running on this thing, uh, after hand handling the exception, we could still go back and uh, continue the execution of our program. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to fast forward through this because it's going to store a lot of values into the stack. So another store, you see that, that it actually stores um, the registers. So that's uh, that should be the value of the D, of the D0 register. It stores the whole context, um, the whole execution context of the processor so that it can be uh, restored afterwards. And a lot more, you can see that this, this LED is still off. So it's still writing to the stack to uh, lower and lower addresses of the stack. You can see that it's counting down the addresses over here again and again and again and again. And at some point it's going to read again. Let's keep all the storing. That's a lot of data. 
Yes. And uh, now it's actually trying to read from uh, from address C. Um, excuse me, zero uh, C, and that address is uh, exactly the interrupt vector that corresponds to the bus. Uh, I'm sorry to to the address error exception. So what it was going to do, af to do afterwards, if we continued uh, in this fashion, is uh, read. Uh, the address of the exception handler and then jump to that point if mem in memory. Uh, there's obviously no point in, in continuing this, uh, but it was uh, quite instructive, I think, to see what happens when an exception is raised.